All right, and we are live. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the uh, Neurosurgery Journey. My name is Liam Goldman. I'm a fourth-year medical student. And today, we're going to be diving headfirst into a topic that is seemingly only going to become more relevant across the professional world in the years to come, um, and, uh, and that's social media usage, in particular, social media usage in medical school. Here to unpack this topic is a medical student who has spent several years building an incredibly popular social media pre uh, presence across multiple different platforms and a YouTube sensation in particular. Uh, you may know him as NDMD. Um, however, here at the Medical College of Georgia, we uh, just call him Andy. So, uh, hey, Andy, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, it's, it's good to be here. And of course, um, you know, it's different being on the guest side of things <laughs> than so used to being um, the host of my own interviews. So, um, but I could have picked a, a better host, man. Liam, thank you so much for having me and um, this incredible platform that you're a part of. Oh, you're too kind. I, um, you know, I, I'd be remiss to to say that I probably would not have reached out to the Brain and Spine Group if it wouldn't have been for you know, our. Uh, friendship and relationship. So I, I appreciate, uh, appreciate all your support. Um, so thanks for that. You know, I, I have the pleasure of not only calling you a classmate, but also a friend. And it seems like whenever we go out to grab a meal or, um, you know, the topic of social media and stuff comes up, uh, and you know, all of its benefits and, and pitfalls, um, you know, admittingly, I'm not the best person to give social media advice as I have no social media accounts. Um, so, you will be our uh, our guide and our expert on this journey and this episode. So um, I, I'm excited to continue the conversation tonight. Of course, of course. I know I've been trying to convince you to get on social media, at least create yourself an Instagram for, for the longest <laughs> time. Um, but you know, like you said, there, there are many benefits to it as well as many pitfalls, especially with kind of the added weight of being – really constantly evaluated um, in medical school as mm. you look to, you know, have your grades for medical, your own uh, home programs, but also any programs that may be looking at you um, for residency. All right. I, I, before we kind of get into things, I wanted to mention, um, I guess, uh, say that, you know, you've talked about this social media medical school um, to quite an extent on your channel. So if, uh, for those listening, uh, go check out NDMD productions and you can listen to some more episodes on this. If you, um, if you, if you so choose, I guess. So before we kind of get into things, um, for those who are listening to this, um, podcast that aren't familiar with you, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, the, the good old, uh, icebreaker and a request. <laughs> um, but so my name is Andy Wynn. Um, on the internet, or at least on YouTube, um, find me as NDMD, kind of a uh, pretty sentimental nickname that I got uh, back in high school from one of my friends who is now a uh, MD, PhD student uh, at Duke Medical College. Uh, but that name stems from kind of just support that I've had along the way in a very accelerated program. So I grew up in Augusta, Georgia. And out of high school, um, took the route of an accelerated BSMD program where you would seek to complete your bachelor's degree in three years and you would have conditional acceptance into um, an affiliated medical college as long as you hit some like GPA, service, interview, and um, MCAT requirements. As long as you hit all those check boxes, you have a guaranteed seat at the Affiliated Medical College, which for me was Medical College of Georgia. Um, as part of that program, I stayed in Augusta um, to do my undergraduate uh, in cell molecular biology at Augusta University. Um, it, it's a pretty small undergrad place, but it, it's been a joy kind of seeing this city and its institutions grow in the same ways that I've grown uh, over the years. Uh, and, and I really attribute a lot of my support, especially to the media side of things, um, to kind of my hometown and maybe some of the smaller um, institutions that I've been a part of um, as, you know, this stuff is, besides the one week of masters, 
Augusta, <laughs> Georgia doesn't exactly like ring any bells to anyone outside of Georgia. You know, it's not the name uh, that's in flashing lights, um, making all the headlines. So, you know, when a faculty resident um, and even like some of my professors in undergrad saw that I was doing some of these things, they were always super supportive because it was like the first person really to kind of push those boundaries and um, you know, a comparatively smaller city. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm in the same class as Liam here. Um, I've been <laughs> very fortunate enough to call him uh, up here, a friend uh, over the past several years. Of, you know, fingers crossed, will uh, <laughs> be matched and graduated in class of 2024. 20, uh, Amen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To, to your point there. Um, yeah, it has been really cool kind of uh, going to medical school in a bit of a, um, you know, smaller city town, um, larger town, uh, I guess. Um, it really has kind of grown a lot, even in these three years or so that I've been here. So I can only imagine what it's been like for you, you know, being here a little bit longer. Um, I get, so you were interested in, in medicine very early uh, in, I guess, because you were committed to a, uh, a BSMD program out of, in, out of uh, high school. What was your inspiration uh, to pursue medicine um, in high in high school yeah um that's a great point and uh, i've i was the fourth full class to go through um this bsnd program at augusta university slash mcg um so I, i've been able to play a pretty you know significant role in growing that program evolving as well as advising prospective um, applicants to it and the one thing i always say for these programs is if at 17 18 years old if you ask yourself, you know, do I want to be a doctor? If it is anything less than 100%, it's a no, and you should not apply to these programs because it is, you know, it's a contractual commitment um, and it is not a short one either. Um, so uh, clinical experience has been the key. I was fortunate enough to um, be involved in a clinical research program kind of between my junior and senior year of high school. Um, and I was actually working in um, a exercise physiology lab um, at MCG, uh, kind of full circle moment. The PI I was working under ended up being my last like CBO preceptor before I went to clerkships. So oh, wow. just fun, fun things about you know living in the same city that you go to med school as. Um, but during that summer, it wasn't your typical like pipetting and uh, <laughs> It, I was kind of like taken under the wing by these two transitioning M1s to M2s at that time. They have since, oh gosh, they're probably done with residency. One uh, went anesthesia, <laughs> one went emergency medicine. Um, and those guys like showed me what it was like to be a medical student and to, you know, have that passion for clinical medicine. Not just that, but because we were a clinical lab, I was actually seeing patients. So it was like my first taste of patient interaction to hear these longitudinal stories of the uh, you know, experimental treatments that were giving these patients a sense of hope. Um, <clears throat> and to follow them over time, see them getting better. I think it was a moment of like, yeah, I can see myself doing this. And, you know, the thing that really hit me was when I would go in and the program was like a nine to five job. I was, I was never looking at the clock um, when I was there. And, you know, that, that's, that's always a good thing and a, a key into your, you're in the right place. Yeah. I, there's a, uh, a saying that I heard in, in college when I was applying to medical school is, is that um, when I was thinking about why medicine and it was, um, Along the lines of um, medicine is the most scientific of the humanities, but the most um, humanitarian of the the sciences, or something along those lines. Uh, and I think that goes a lot along with what you were saying, where you were kind of you know in the lab and and seeing and working on kind of like the background of 
these treatments, but then also seeing it on the clinical side there and, and um, seeing the, the humanistic aspect of, of medicine and bringing those two things together. It's, I think it really is um, something that uh, is so beautiful. Um, so let's, let's kind of transition into the social media um, side of things now. Um, why did you get into social media? Uh, what was your inspiration and like, how did all this uh, start? Um, so before, from, before medical school, I did have a background as a professional, like freelance photographer, videographer. Um, <clears throat> I picked up a camera back in high school, like, and for anybody that knows cameras, my first one was a Canon T1i. It literally did not even have autofocus. Um, but I was like student section leader, student by president, you know, all the stuff that literally does not matter at all um, anymore back in high school. But you know, I was part of hyping the student body up and making things look really, really cool to get students to these events. And I found that photography was such a fantastic way of capturing moments and emotions and, you know, propelling the people who are watching or viewing such content towards action. And, um, mm. I think I, I really found joy in that just started off on my own learning from, well, YouTube videos and, uh, you know, making my own <laughs> trial and errors along the way. Um, in college, I continued doing uh, photos, got more into like event and portrait photography. And then for the student ministry I was a part of, I got like semi-formally trained in video side of things. And I started working at like our big annual conferences and stuff. And once med school rolled around, I had all this experience um, of like the back end editing workflow, all that. And it was a skill set that I loved and enjoyed. It's an art that I enjoyed and I didn't want to lose that. And you know, I, I think I kind of stumbled upon <laughs> YouTube as I think every, every kid nowadays has like in the back of their head, I kind of want to be a YouTuber. <laughs> uh, on the side or like you know that's really cool you know, that's something that 10 15 years ago nobody would desire as the, a side hustle let alone a career um but i i saw that i had i had the ability to create good videos i saw specifically that it was hard to make connections because uh, keep in mind when we first entered med school, it was peak COVID. So like nobody could interact with each other, you know, virtual world through photo video calls was, that was how we connected. And so like many things, this channel kind of was the birth product of COVID and isolation. Um, and my first serious video was about my BSMD program. It was like a 40 minute long rambling <laughs> of <laughs> a poorly lit Andy sitting in his bedroom trying to use kind of the, the videography fundamentals I had to share my own experiences, something that I saw was not out there on the platform. Because when you look up these programs, it was always, how do I stat pad to get in? Like, what do I need to say to get into these programs? What MCAT score do I need? And it was all from the standpoint of like an admissions officer, but never like a, hey, what is it like to be a student from these programs? Like, what is it like when you actually get in? Right. Um, and so I remember that video getting like the first like thousand views. And I was kind of like, oh my gosh, what is happening <laughs> right now? But to a greater extent, I saw the comments of like, this is so useful. It's something that I've, never seen before and i'm looking into these programs and you've answered all my questions thank you and that was like the first time i saw like man the videos that you make can really have an impact on people across the country and in the world in the same way that you know i was on panels for accepted or prospective applicants for my program now i just did a panel basically for the entire country or even world if you want to apply to this program. And so that outreach was huge. And um, again, kind of riding that 
revelation of the first couple of comments. I was like, you know what? Okay, there's this is this is worth doing. It's something more than just I'm trying to be YouTube famous or like I want to get as many views as possible, get a giant plaque or whatever. Um, there, there's real substance to it. I think the success of your channel um, is definitely a testament to to that, that you're really reaching and uh, striking a chord with um, individuals around the world. Um, I, I want to, I guess, share a story. Um, when I, when we first got to medical school, it, we had orientation week and I remember sitting there chatting with my uh, little orientation group um, and they were, they said, have you met the have you met the YouTuber yet? Have you met the, you know, there's a, <laughs> there's a, a student in the class who does YouTube. And I was like, no, no. And I just remember hearing, hearing your name, Andy, Andy. And I was like, oh my gosh, I got to meet this guy. Everyone loves him. And I remember seeing you um, outside in front of the education commons and, uh, you know, filming a video. I was like, oh my gosh, that's the, that's the guy. That's the guy I got to go meet him. And now here we are three years later, consider you one of my closest friends here in school. So it's uh you know really really cool um i i want to uh so you've been in the game for a while um and you've talked to many students you've talked to residents physicians nurses pas um you know almost all facets facets of the medical field and, and through these experiences um what are some things that you've learned about social media um, and its function in medical school, maybe just for the, the, the common medical student who uh, doesn't have a, um, doesn't consider themselves a content creator, just the, the typical medical mm. student making their way through school. So I, I think a big thing that, you know, will, I'm not going to say strike a chord with some of the, the older generation, but I think um, it's an idea that is consistently being challenged is that like, I'm just going to use a quick example. I was on my sub by and where we have like an operation that we need to do. I'm with my intern. We got a couple minutes between cases. This, this is a approach that the intern had no idea how to do. Neither did I, we go up to the resident room and like, you know, 10, 20 years ago, what are you, what are you doing in those minutes? you're opening up a book, you're going like, Oh my gosh. Okay. What, what is this approach? What are structures involved? You know what I saw? I was sitting behind, behind his office with my laptop open while he was sitting at his cubicle on his computer. We were watching the same YouTube video of that <laughs> approach. And that really comes to show like how things have really changed as far as medical education goes. Um, and a lot of attendings will admit it too, that, like you can consume and understand like a chapter's worth of information in a five minute video if it's really well done and that, that's the beauty of where we are now yeah. and not just that but it's free it's on youtube like you, you don't have to buy a subscription or a book for that you can just you know look it up and so you know to the students that don't have social media first and foremost it's a resource you know um I, i'm working on hopefully in the next couple weeks uh submitting a manuscript about how program social media is perceived and can be better optimized for uh applicants in the field of anesthesiology because we we sent out a huge survey wondering for you know the past classes that have graduated, how did you use social media to find out about your program? And a lot of them do. You know, they mm. they search Instagram, they search Twitter, they search Facebooks, they see videos on you know the program website and are like, okay, this is something that I can quickly consume and get an idea of the culture of the program, who's there, um, you know, even scheduling. Uh, within the years, all this information that you want very, very quickly. And if done well, that sticks with whoever's consuming that content way more than an essay or like, here's a PDF booklet uh, of what we have to offer. You no, know? 
so it, it's such a huge resource now when done correctly um, within medical school and particularly just like academic medicine. Um, and then on top of that, not only is it a resource, but it's a form of connection. Uh, I, I think that can be understated a lot, but the amount of opportunities I've had um, to just talk with a chief resident, to talk with an intern resident, to talk with a attending from a completely di different institution that like we have no reason to ever talk to each other, except for the fact that, hey, we're both making videos and I'm really interested in the same field you are. Let's talk and, and see how we can work together. Like those are doors and opportunities that I, I think will go buried in the conversation of social media and medicine, because I think a lot of the, the connotation of it is it's a red flag. You're going to get immediately canceled, you know, watch your every single step, watch your every single upload, which I'm not saying that you, you don't have to, you still do, but there is definitely opportunity within it that can be taken advantage of if you do it well. That's a, Good point. Um, good point of transition as well. Uh, social media as a student, um, I feel it can be a fine line. Uh, as you mentioned at the beginning, right, we're, we, as students, we're kind of under this, um, you know, microscope where we're constantly being um, evaluated. Um, and so you can use it to benefit yourself, but you could also use uh, social media to possibly hurt yourself. Um, and so what I, I guess kind of explicitly are some ways that you could use social media in a way that might um, uh, harm your chances of, of the ultimate goal of matching into a uh, residency program. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, I, I get a lot of questions in like my email inbox and just like in general for people who want to start um, their own social media pages and everything. And, you know, my first question to them you know, after they get it all out of their system of, hey, what camera do I buy? Uh, what what uh, platform should I main? Um, what's my content strategy supposed to be? I'm like, why do you want to do this? It, is it for is it for views? Is it for subscribers? Is it in the hopes that one day you can monetize this? Is it in the hopes that one day this gives you the opportunity to leave medicine? If it's any of those, you fail before you've uploaded your first video. Not to say that any of those intentions are inherently wrong, but people can smell that out, you know, when you're uploading. I, I truly believe that some of the best creators are the ones who are just authentic really keep things real and that's how they keep the audience that they do um i try my best to do that um but at, at the same time it's like there's a lot of hardships in med school that i think you have to you have to keep tied down um because they're personal you know, there, there's a fine line between being a good resource being a good role model and just venting to the world so, right. um, you know, my rule always with you know, scrubbing through all my videos, whenever I do my interviews, I'm going frame by frame by frame, blurring out anything that could even have a possibility of a HIPAA violation. I, when I first started my YouTube, I, I was upfront. I emailed our Dean. I emailed like the media people and was like, Hey man, I want to do this. I have this background. Who do I need to talk to and so that I can let them know I'm doing this and that like if there's anything I can't record or there's any rules I need to follow, that I abide by them, you know? Because I'd much rather be upfront and honest with the people that are above me and evaluating me than to just do it and then get an angry email like way down the road. And, right. you know, if you're honest about why you're doing it, they're going to be supportive of it. And that's why I'm very grateful for MCG. They were very supportive of, uh, you know, what I was doing because 
they saw that was very beneficial to um, students everywhere. Um, and so I would say like, before you post anything or you get going with this, if you're in medical school, just ask your dean, ask your advisors, just be like, hey, this is something that I'm doing. I want to be able to do this right. So who do I need to talk to? And that just clears the air between everybody, makes sure everybody's on the same page. Because a lot of trouble with social media comes from just miscommunication and leading to misinterpretation. Um, yeah. Right. And so, you know, that kind of mitigates a lot of somewhat of your administrative stuff, but also whenever you're posting anything, like I watch it over 10 times. I'm like, would I be proud to show this? to somebody that is like interviewing me for residency. If I have any doubt, it, it's gotta be 100% yes. If it is 0.0001% no, I'm not uploading it. And that's just a golden rule for, for everybody. And I, I don't think you can necessarily have to have a huge following to follow that rule either. Right. Um, that's just, social media safety 101 to, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. Um, but you know, having that baseline you know, recognition that you are uh, being evaluated uh, will help. And again, I'm not saying that you post things that you or hide the things that you enjoy to do. If you love skydiving, post a picture of you skydiving, because that's what you love to do. You know, it, it's just there, there are pictures, words, videos that are best not uploaded and best, you know, broken down amongst people you trust, your friends, your family, um, your advisors. Um, and I, I can't really have any rules as far as like what, where that line is. Um, Mm -hmm. They just use your best judgment. Everybody in medical school is smart. Um, so follow your gut. If right. your gut says don't post this, don't. I think, I think that's really well said. Um, one thing that I, I didn't really think about until, until you brought it up, right, is the uh, idea of um, uh, HIPAA violations. That's something really important that medical students in particular have, uh, have a unique um, uh, I guess could possibly have a unique issue with uh, with uh, social media. Uh, you know, it's really. I remember at the beginning of um, our, our school years when they started rolling out the vaccines, and we had big vaccination clinics, and it was a really exciting time, and um, and a lot of people were really excited and taking pictures. And it was important to remember at that time that you know that these are patients and sometimes they would don't want their um, don't want their information to be shared online and um, in a public forum so um, that's definitely something as medical students to be definitely be cognizant of um, yeah. down the road not only in addition to making sure that you um, kind of are upholding a, a profile that's um, you know professional in a way but also um, I guess showing who you are, and in your interests, and I, and to that point, I, I'd like to ask: um, how, how do you how do you recommend someone balance your professional image versus your non professional or, or lifestyle outside of uh, medical school and medicine on your social media? Oh, that's that's a good question. It's hard. Um, Samir, what's up, man? <laughs> I see you in chat. Appreciate the love. Um, that's that's a hard hard question to answer um probably because i personally have overcomplicated it uh as well i think i think the answer <laughs> answer is a lot simpler than i make it out to be um I, I think it's easier the smaller following you have to separate um the two entities i, I think now for me it's it's difficult um for example when i'm on rotations I I never bring up my YouTube unless brought up to me. Just because when I'm when I'm there, I'm not I'm not there to film. 
I'm not there, Andy, the YouTuber. I'm Andy, the medical student, here to learn, here to be a part of the team that I'm around. And so I, I never really talk about it. And um, it's funny, I still remember on my internal medicine rotation, um, on my last week uh, on the cardiology service, we had an attending switch and he was like a young, fresh out of a, fresh out of uh, fellowship attending. And we step out of the, the room, getting ready for rounds, we're just standing around and like my attending just stops looks at me up and down and goes, do you have a YouTube channel? And I just kind of like bust out laughing and I say yes. And all my residents whip around and, and they're just like, you have what? And <laughs> like, no, it, but in the most like positive, like that's so impressive. We really love this stuff and it makes a unique way. However, I, that's a coin flip that I'm not really willing to gamble on in important times like clinical rotations, you know, because some people can, can view that as a very positive and unique thing, but others can view that as a, Oh, you know, you're a cloud chaser. Oh, you, this is like your entire personality or, Oh my gosh, I have to watch my back. Cause I'm going to get filmed, you know, when I'm not looking. And so all of that just distracts you from being present and, and learning and doing your mm. job as a medical student. So for me, you know, I, I know you asked like keeping professional or, or I guess like personal versus social media, or was it more professional and social media? Professional versus your, I guess, kind of non-professional lifestyle. Side I guess of that, things. yeah, I guess that wraps social media in it. Um, so yeah, like for me, I, I keep those two separate unless brought up to. Um, and I, I never hide it. It's not like I, I deny that I have a YouTube channel or anything. But that's just not why I'm in med school. That's not who I am on rotations. Um, so again, I just, I don't bring it up. And I've had residents tell me it's a bad thing that I don't bring it up. There, I've had residents <laughs> tell me that, you know, you should, you should talk about this so much more because all the other residents don't know about this. But yeah, there, there's that part of me that goes, I'm not really willing to play that game on the off chance that you know, an attending or resident doesn't like it. And it, it does, that, that is kind of the cost of battle of having a social media presence in medical school, because like, you know, your intentions, right? You know why you do it. And it's also not really your job to convince other people of your intentions right. and no matter what you say what you do somebody's going to misinterpret it and you won't be able to change their mind um and, that, and that's just you know the con the constant con of social media you know, the truth gets skewed and you have no alibi you just have to be like okay you're going to believe what you believe <laughs> and you know for when you're combating keyboard warriors that's no issue. When you're talking about your chief resident or attending, then okay, that that situation gets a little bit more complex. So for me, uh, if you do have a social media presence or want to create you know, a profile while you're in medical school, be upfront about it to the people that like you need to administration, everything clear the room, make sure that you are aware of the rules that you need to follow to keep you, your patients, and your team safe. Two, just don't make it your personality. Don't never, never, ever introduce yourself as like, hey, my name is so-and-so. I have so many followers, or I'm a big deal on TikTok or, or YouTube or whatever. That will never play in your favor. <laughs> um, and really, three... Be proud of the work that you do. You know, if, if it's acknowledged by the people around you, like accept it because you truly do earn any sort of following um, based off the art and the really perseverance that you have. It, 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 it's a lot of hard work and time put in that nobody really sees to make 
each and any individual post, whether it's YouTube, TikTok, or Instagram. So like th those I think would be my three guidelines to create that boundary, but also navigate how I think unique that relationship gets. Um, and, and I will say clinical rotations is like the place where you need to navigate it the most carefully. Right, right. Uh, so, so I guess more so on the business perspective, um, and kind of taking this more into, I guess, like in, um, yeah, it's just more so on the business side of things. What's the best platform for students to use when they're here in medical school? Um, what ways can students use these platforms to help advance their careers? Um, so that, I think, depends on your eventual career goals. So I, I think every everybody has to make the decision um when they graduate you know residency and everything do they want to go private practice or academics and there is space for social media in both and just huge opportunity in both spheres so within academics we've already hinted on kind of like the medical education opportunities there particularly within the surgical fields like it's huge and it's a growing resource that will always need more content. Um, and, you know, one of my big inspirations is, um, hold on. <laughs> oh, Dr. Antonio Webb. There's so many. Yeah. Uh, that, Dr. Oh yeah. Antonio Webb. Dr. Webb. Um, fantastic content creator, but also an incredible surgeon and, you know, some of my first exposures to orthopedics was watching his spine videos where he's literally taking GoPro footage from his head and uploading it. And, you know, that, uh, that honestly is both academics and also private practice. That's a fantastic example, actually, of private practice because he owns his own practice in Texas. And all of those videos and educational things that he's putting on his channel is more evidence that he's a fantastic surgeon he knows what he's doing and building up this ethos of you can trust me with your spine surgery right and you know if you have a large presence you how, how many times are you really like diving diving deep for a specific doctor Un unless it's a super major surgery not too often so right. if your name is a very big name just by like recency bias, you'll say, oh, you know, I think he's pretty good. Let's, let's go to his practice. Um, and I think I can also apply for academics too. Um, obviously here, Dr. Uh, Dr. Rakowski um, has his own channels and everything. And man, based off of his channel, he, he got an interview invite from, from Vice, I think, to talk about like, oh, yeah. Bob's Hodgett's death or something. He made a video on it that went viral, but because he made a video about it and he is Dr. Rakowski, neurosurgeon, it builds this ethos that now all of a sudden people are going to search for that person's name and go, if I need a brain surgery, I want this guy because I've seen his videos. He knows what he's talking about. Um, and that's that's kind of like on the surface level how social media can benefit you in your career um, as far as a business perspective you know you have people seeking you um, but again kind of going back to academics it's a way of recruiting um, potential applicants to your program and no matter what what specialty you have or you're going into it's a way of um, bringing in funding to different programs. You can showcase the incredible innovation that you have, you know, amongst your residents and faculty. And now all of a sudden, if that video catches wind, companies are like, or even investors are going, okay, they're doing something really cool here. We should look into this more. Um, and so I'm talking to all the hospital administrators out there that you should invest in your social media and let it be run or at least have it be overseen by actual physicians, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, but yeah, academics, I could go on and on about um, how that's super beneficial with, within that sphere. Um, I think the private practice implications are much more obvious. I've worked with a, a lot of surgeons who own private practices, a lot of physicians who are graduating residency and about to enter private practice that are leveraging their social media platforms as ways to direct patient traffic to their practices, which then you know, in turn, it turns into more revenue. And you know, a lot of them started their social media presence in residency you know, before they had it. So, you know, the work that you do even as a medical student can eventually spill over down the road into your career and can really get you outreach that no billboards or Facebook ads are ever going to do. Right, right. For the medical student in particular, um, you know, personally, I know of a few colleagues who have you know gotten involved in research projects by simply DMing residents or or attendings even. Um, and as somebody who doesn't have social media, this is kind of a foreign you know topic to me. But um, you know, it seems like something that's becoming more commonplace. Um, and so while networking or connecting with physicians, um, you know, I've I've had to use the old email, uh, but you know. DMing does seem like a way, does seem like a, a, a um, you know, a, a valuable, uh, I guess, avenue to take for students. Um, what are your opinions on that? I know that, you know, every physician, every resident is going to have different, um, I guess, opinions on it. Um, but I, I would like to hear well, your thoughts on that. Well, uh, in my personal experience, I've done both and have gotten research shadowing networking opportunities both ways i just personally don't enjoy instagram dms um or dms in general um just because like if i'm getting a ton of nonsense in, in my dms and i have to filter all of it out i can't imagine what a physician would be getting so for me, I always tell people the best way to reach me is through my business email because it's like if you took the time and did an email, you're you're pretty serious about what you're asking me or right. wanting to do. That is sad to say that I have never DM'd your know, physicians, tending to residents for advice. Oh yeah, I, I've done it and I've gotten great responses. It's just, I think um, you're gonna. There's a higher percent success rate on the email side of things <laughs> than, than the um, DMs. And you know, I, I'm sure you'll get a ton of people saying, okay, DMs are very unprofessional, which like I can see where they're coming from, to be honest. Um, it, you kind of have to read the room, kind of read the, the person receiving the message too. If they seem like a very you know, academic research heavy person, maybe DMs aren't the way to go for that. Right. Now, if it's a simple DM of, hey, I'm interested in working with you, what's an email that, what's a good email that I can reach you at? I don't see there's any problem with that. It's, I think that's a good middle ground of, I want the connection, but I also want a more formal means of communication that will show you that I'm serious about working with you. Right, gotcha. We have a, a question here in the chat. Um, yeah. It says, um, from Jeremiah, thank you for your question. Um, would you guys suggest starting a YouTube channel in college while in pre-med? Curious if I should start. What are your thoughts, Andy? Um, are you, I mean, my question would be if you're planning continuing it throughout medical school and also kind of like what your niche would be. Uh, I, I think like in this particularly YouTube creator world, you have to figure out where your little network is. I was about to say bubble, but let's use the word network because, you know, that's how the algorithm recognizes who to get your videos out to and without diving way, way too deep <laughs> in, into kind of algorithm talk and social media <laughs> outreach in that regard know what kind of videos you want to make know what you want to make them about and if anything 
if YouTube is your platform of choice, I would highly recommend just learning basics of cinematography, lighting, camera settings, and most importantly, editing. Because I see so many students as like a first or second year um, want to start a channel and they come to me and they're like, yo, I got all this, I got all this, like I have all these ideas. Like, how, how do I get started? I'm like, well, you have to edit them. They're like, okay, sweet. That means I can get, you know, weekly uploads like you, right? I'm like, sure. And then they sit down and they're like, why is it taking me a week and a half to edit a 11 minute video? And I'm just like, it's, it's tough. And that just takes time. And, you know, I credit a lot of my ability to keep up with my videos while in med school to my previous professional background because I already knew my workflow for editing. And a lot of the med students that are coming in wanting to be a YouTuber are having to learn the software while learning everything else in med school. And your brain only has so much space and there's only so many hours in the day. So if you are planning on maybe doing something medical related, start out very simple with just learning the software, pick your choice. You know, if you're an Apple user, Final Cut or even iMovie is free. Um, you know, if you're Windows, Premiere is great. Um, and on both, a fantastic free software is DaVinci Resolve. Um, I, I see a lot of pros actually moving to DaVinci Resolve nowadays. So pick one, learn it, um, get a workflow down, and you should, that's the stage you want to be in as a college student to get you prepared for if you desire to do it in med school. Awesome. Great answer. I, I, Jeremiah, I appreciate your question. That was, um, as we get close to the end of the discussion here, that was one of my final questions. Or any advice to um, students wanting to pursue uh, medicine also interested in starting a YouTube channel? So thank you for that. I guess um, adjacent to that question, do you have any advice for just college students or medical students in general out there um, looking to pursue uh, medicine? Oh, man. I, I think I would offer us a tag team this because um, – <laughs> we we offer two very different perspectives uh, on the field. I, I think, you know, my situation is very unique. Not many people can make that decision or even want to make that decision at 17, 18 years old. Um, it, it's a commitment for sure. But you know, I, as like kind of a hopeless romantic storyteller, have felt the most joy um, being in this field because you truly see the most human moments that this experience and existence has to offer. Um, but not just that, but offer some semblance of hope and help um, in those moments. And truly there is nothing more beautiful um, than that. So like I would say, get some clinical experience for sure. Um, regardless of if your program requires clinical experience hours, it's just good to get an idea of what you're getting yourself into. Um, because there, there's also a lot of back end work that people don't see and you know, nobody on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok is really gonna glorify like the amount of notes that you have to do administrative stuff, running up and down the stairs, like getting papers to where they need to be, you know, tracking down labs to see if they're actually done. Those are all things that aren't, they aren't pretty in this field. So getting some shadow experience um, to see that true side of things will help you guide your decision. I think also a big word of advice, particularly for um, those who are watching my own content as well as any other, um, med creators uh content is to understand that we're trying to like we're trying to be helpful we're trying to stay positive but there are so many moments off camera that are very difficult however do not let any of us convince you and i'm, I'm telling that 
I, I'm saying that to my own audience too. Do not let any of us convince you that medicine isn't worth it. Um, there's this narrative across social media that once you get in, your only objective is how to figure out a way out. And uh, Dr. Rikowski, um aggressively touched on this um, in one of his videos because the, there are a lot of creators that are just like making medicine out to be just a horrific field. Are there terrible moments? Yes. But none of us, none of us went on YouTube to become a YouTuber. I think we, we wanted to share our stories and true experiences to an audience that may not have the chance to see what it's like um, in the life of a medical student or resident physician. That's why the whole 73 question series started. It's because I know there are so many people that don't have the luxury of having a friend's family who's a doctor in the local hospital, or they might not even have the luxury of having a local hospital around them to shadow like or even talk to a dermatologist, a neurosurgeon, and an orthopedic surgeon, plastic surgeon. So, you know, we're, we're on YouTube to share those stories to people that don't have access to it. Um, and to have fun along the way, like, keep things real. Just don't, do not let any of our tired eyes and sometimes like, <laughs> defeated attitudes um, turn you away from it. And I think that's a con of social media, to be honest, and it's something I'm, I'm learning even now, how to navigate that. Yeah, well, I, I, I really appreciate your perspective there. I, I have to echo a lot of what you said. Um, it's, it's the journey to um, being a physician, getting that MD at the end of your um, name there is, is it, it's long and, 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 it's, and it's hard. It's not easy. Um, but to be able to put your hand on someone's shoulder and say, like, I can help you, um, you know, I can get you through this. Um, or to see somebody who just completely turn a corner on um, with the disease and, and, and heal right before your eyes is, um, or even be able to fix that with your hands um, is, is so incredible. Um, such an incredible experience. And um, and so keep pushing. If it's something that you're interested in, explore it. Like Andy said, get involved, um, shadow, uh, do what you can there, um, just to see if it's for you. Cause it's not for everybody. And if you, um, if you, if you don't think it's for you, then, uh, don't continue to push a, a square peg into a round hole, you know, just, um, it's, it's not for everybody and that's all right. Uh, it's, um, but keep, um, keep pushing if it's, if it's what you're passionate about, uh, and so, Andy, I, I appreciate your time. Uh, you, I know you're really busy with everything um, on the clinical side and also on your your social media side. Uh, you're you're doing some incredible things. Oh, look here, we got a, a final question. I'll question. I'll put that up on the uh, on the screen here. So, while studying in med school, does it get easier to focus on studying because of the habit building? Thank you, Jeremiah, for your for your question again. I'll, uh, Andy, you can take that one. Uh. Yes, uh, although I easier to focus on studying. I, I, I don't know if I would say it's easier to focus. I think it's more just it becomes a part of who you are. And, you know, therefore, because of the habit, it's just like it doesn't feel like work anymore. It's just like, OK, I, I wake up. I know what I want to study. Um, and I don't I don't think it necessarily like makes it easier to focus, but there is an intrinsic motivation um, when you have the hab baseline habit set. And especially once you get to your clinicals, you're like you're no longer studying because crap, I need to make this score on this test. It's I need to study because, man, this is going to show up in one of my patients like tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so that definitely makes things a lot a lot easier, um, but I, I will say as kind of a habitual Anki user that, yeah, I just, 
I get used to waking up and just slapping a space bar. Um, <laughs> again, I, I just, I don't know if that, I don't know if focus is the right word. Liam, do you have any, <laughs> any takes on it? Um, so while studying in med school, does it get easier to focus on studying because of the habit building? Um, yes, you, I guess in a way you, um, you do get better at understanding how you learn um, and what works for you. Uh, I think in, in college, every class was something different. And I think to an extent here in medical school, every kind of topic I, I approached a little bit differently, but um, you kind of are able to adjust more and, um, and you're more adaptable uh, to different styles of teaching and um, in the different topics that you, that you study. Uh, you know, it's the, I wouldn't say it gets much easier to sit down for, you know, a long extended period of time uh, and study. That's, I guess, for me against my nature, I think I'm a little bit more, um, you know, ADD, like to be a little bit more active throughout my day. So uh, it's not been the most natural thing for me. Um, but like Andrew said, it is, the things that we're studying are incredibly relevant to uh, what we see in the clinic. So um, that makes things, uh, you know, when you have that relevance of what you're studying, it actually makes it easier to, um, you know, it, uh, to, to learn and to um, then apply in the clinic. Um, thank you for that question, Jeremiah. I appreciate it. Um, and we have a question, where are you headed for residency? Uh, we, we don't know yet. <laughs> I just, will, I hope know, for residency. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I hope at some point that that will happen. <laughs> um, maybe catch us in a, maybe we'll come back in a year and we'll, uh, we'll let you know then. Um, okay. If all goes, if all goes to pl plan. Um, so Andy, I just want to say, yeah, thanks again for, for your time. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to, to come chat with us and um, teach us a little bit about uh, how to navigate um, medical school uh, in the with social media. So um, I appreciate your time. Oh, likewise, I, I appreciate your time as well. I know you're you're busy studying for some big exams coming up. And uh, again, thank you to <laughs> the whole brain and spine group. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thankful for y'all support. And I know a lot of a lot of the members do watch my stuff and I'm just incredibly grateful to, to really have your support and see people who watch my stuff um, in person. Again, yeah, you know, Liam, you're, you're a part of a great group and you guys are another living, breathing example of you know, how connected social media and medicine can be. Oh, well, I we appreciate you here at uh, brain and spine group. Um, Thank you again. And uh, again, uh, to those listening out there, if you wanted to check out more videos about social media and medical school or anything else, really, um, you know, you can go check out the Brain and Spine Group or you can go check out NDMD Productions. Um, he's got, you know, he's active on TikTok. He's active on YouTube. He's got podcasts. He's got uh, many different um, yeah, platforms out there. So thanks again for everyone stopping by. Um, and uh, you can join us on the next episode next week. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone.